I don't know. I don't have it up right now. Come on out, ladies. Stand right here. Quiet. It's been a little while since we've since we've sung this with these ladies. They did a wonderful job the last time. They're going to do a wonderful job again tonight. Let us quickly start this together, all right? Let me get to page one here. Ready?
of the Christmas season, peace on earth. <coughs> peace among nations, peace among brothers and sisters, peace with ourselves. We give gifts, we sing carols, and roast chestnuts. Well, maybe we only think about that one. In any case, we do all these things in the hope of finding peace. But peace always seems to remain elusive. One of the most remarkable stories of Christmas comes from one of the darkest moments of our history. World War I ravaged a continent, leaving destruction and debris in its wake. The human cost, well in the millions, staggers us. But from the midst of this dark conflict comes the story of Christmas truce of 1914. The Western Front, only a few months into the war, was a deplorable scene of devastation. Perhaps as if to give the combatants one day to breathe again, a truce was called from Christmas Eve through Christmas Day. As darkness settled over the front like a blanket, the sound of exploding shells and the rat-tat-tat of gunfire faded. Faint carols in French and English, voices on one side, and in German voices on the other, rose to fill the silent night. By morning, soldiers at first hesitantly began filing out of the maze of trenches into the dreaded and harsh soil of no man's land. There was more singing. Gifts of rations and cigarettes were exchanged. Family photos were passed around. Soccer balls appeared. Up and down the Western Front, soldiers who only before had been locked in deathly combat now faced off in a soccer game. For one brief but entirely remarkable day, there was peace on earth. Some have called the Christmas truce of 1914 <coughs> the miracle on the Western Front. Anxious to print some good news, the Times of London reported on the events of this Christmas truce. Soldiers recorded the day in letters home and in their diaries. Some of those lines made it into the newspapers while others remained unknown until later they were brought to light. Here's one such line from the diary of a German infantryman. The English brought a soccer ball from the trenches and pretty soon a lively game ensued. How marvelously wonderful, yet how strange it was. The English officers felt the same way about it. Thus Christmas, the celebration of love, managed to bring mortal enemies together as friends for a time. Friends for a time. The celebration of love, <coughs> peace on earth. This is the meaning of Christmas. But the celebrations, these truces don't last. After Christmas Day, the soccer balls and the soldiers went back into the trenches. The Christmas carols subsided and the war carried on. And even though World War I eventually ended, a few short decades later, Europe's countryside and cities became the field of battle once again, as did Africa and the Pacific during World War II. Events like the Christmas truce are worth celebrating, but they lack something. They lack permanence. Such impermanent peace is what we often find in our quest for the real meaning of Christmas. If we are looking for permanent and ultimate goodwill, love, and peace, we must look beyond our gift-giving, our get-togethers, our office parties. We must look to no other place than to a manger. We must look to Jesus.